to Ponte Pilas. Today we have a very special guest. He goes by the name of Seth. Seth, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Pleasure to sit down and, and finally meet and talk to you. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, thank you. Uh, for those who don't know Seth, Seth, um, what is it exactly that you do? Uh, so what I do is I'm an uh, I'm a uh, exotic car dealer, to put it simply. So I spend most of my time buying and selling high end cars, um, ranging typically from three hundred thousand to two, three, four million in that range. So some pretty cool stuff, high end stuff. Um, most of my day is is focused on buying. I'm trying to acquire cars, and I do that from a lot of different private clients and other dealers, and buy and sell mostly wholesale. So I do business with other dealers as well, mostly just sourcing cars. That's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. And how, how do you get started in that field? What drove you to, to go into the exotic market? Yeah, so I got started in cars um, when I was about 22 years old. And I actually started working at a Honda dealership. And so nothing nothing exotic. That's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just, just selling yeah. Hondas. And it... it, it introduced me to the car business and taught me about the sales process with cars and different things involved, um, which really translates to any sort of car that you're that you're dealing with. So over you know about 10 or 12 years, I worked at different car dealerships, nothing high end. Um, also worked a little bit around the car business, doing marketing for some marketing companies, worked for uh, cars.com. So, you know, you, you know, doing um, marketing stuff and having dealers as clients, but I was always kind of in and around the car business. Um, getting into exotics, you know, I was actually never the guy that, growing up I never had posters of cars on my wall. I was never obsessed with cars. I was never, um, you know, a, a car nut. Um, but it really just comes down to relationships and, and meeting people and forming relationships with somebody originally, um, a guy, Dave, that I met that still owns a dealership locally. Um, him and I formed a relationship and he had been doing exotic cars for, you know, 20 years or whatever for, for a long time. That was, that was what he did. And just through him and I having a relationship and wanting to work together is how I originally was introduced, introduced to, to doing that, nice. um, and learning from him. Uh, and that was really for exotic stuff. I've really only been doing it for maybe four years in that range. That's crazy. Um, yeah. and you know, kind of worked my way up and worked at high-end stores and, and was most recently the general manager of an Aston Martin dealership. Okay. And then almost a year ago decided to leave and go out on my own um, with another partner and do, do something still in the exotic cars, but just in a very different way and, okay. and be a business owner. And um, I've really enjoyed it and it's, it's That's been amazing. great. Yeah. How, how's that experience been for you? It's been great. I mean, the thing about kind of jumping off a cliff and you know i left a job that i, I was making good money it yeah. was a great career i had you know i wasn't wanting for anything it was it was a great job and um i could have done that for forever it was a great career i just knew i wanted to do something different i wanted to kind of take that leap and try to build something for myself continue to try to build my own brand and build build my own business um and it was scary. I mean, I really kind of just left rather abruptly and said, I don't know exactly what I'm going to do or how, how I'm going to do it, but I'm just going to go figure it out. That's amazing. And I, and I think, you know, we try to overthink a lot of times of like, and, and any piece of advice that I, I received from people before I quit and went on my own was, well, you know, why don't you kind of work on it on the side, you know, try to get something going and then maybe eventually you can make the transition. Even my partner that I work with every day now told me the same thing. Yeah. He's like, it's, it's difficult. You know, don't just jump into it. Don't leave a, a well-paying job. Um, but ultimately, I think the best choice for me was just cutting it off. Okay. Right. Just jumping off the cliff, hoping the, the, the wingsuit that I just built worked. Yeah. And just figuring it out. Um, and that's what I've been able to do. It hasn't always been super smooth and easy, but I figured it out. I've been more successful with it, I think, than I expected. You know, I, I kind of jumped into it thinking, okay, I might not make any money for six months or more. And and it turns out that wasn't the case. Okay. You know, fortunately. Um, 
That's, and, that's amazing. That's pretty yeah. good. And I think, you know, like for me, starting this venture myself with like the media and everything, mm -hmm. it's just, like you said, that blanket of security of having something consistently stable. Mm -hmm. And it's just that, that fear that we all, you know, we know that jumping that cliff, like you said, um, that's where, you know, without risk, there's no reward, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, just amazing to hear that you, you took that risk and yeah. without anticipation, you're, you're killing it, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think, I think the biggest thing is you can't plan your way into success, right? You just yeah. have to take action. And I always tell myself, I, I'm not even overly worried about taking the perfect action, doing, doing things the perfect way. I just make a decision and I do it. And if it needs to be adjusted, then I adjust as I go and figure it out. That's you don't have idea. to have everything perfect planned ahead of time to do it. You just have to do it and then you'll figure it out. That's and, good. And, and That's make good. changes. Yeah, that's amazing. So in the segment of Ponte Pilas, we have Ponte Pilas comes from my culture. And it's just a saying that we tell ourselves when we're in a position, whether it's a rut or just a place in your life that you're not satisfied or you're going through an extreme hardship and you tell yourself this to kind of get out of that situation and kind of get momentum to start going. Um, where in your life were you in a position that you were unsatisfied with or just, you know, in that position of, of, of chaos, I would say that you told yourself Ponte Pilas and what did you do? Yeah, I mean, my life story, I think, is pretty interesting, and there's a lot to it. There's a lot of layers. It's very yeah. long, but a big part of my story and <clears throat> my career is my life really kind of started over like five or six years ago. Like, it's almost like, not that I was reborn, but I feel like I was born like five or six years ago, and, and now I'm living a life that's completely different because prior to that, from you know, 18 years old up until my late 20s, I was addicted to drugs okay and i was actually i was an iv heroin user so pretty much my life revolved around just finding money to buy drugs and, and obviously the chaos that that comes with that and did a lot of damage to myself my family my loved ones um and, and then th through i mean this is you're talking over a period of 10 years trying different things to to get out of it and, 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 you know, find recovery and, and do, do, you know, whatever I could, I finally figured it out about six years ago. Okay. Right. And, and I've, um, I got to a point where the, the big moment for me, kind of my, my, my Ponte Pilas moment, I guess you can say is the mindset shift for me was, you know, up until that moment, I had spent the previous decade trying to hide what I was doing and who I was and the mistakes that I had made. And I was, you know, rightfully and understandably ashamed, but I just made, made a decision one day to just own it That's and just amazing. basically say, yeah, you know, this is me. I made these mistakes. Uh, and I did it in a very overt way where I actually ended up kind of going on TV and speaking about it. I ended up writing in, in newspapers about it and basically had the mindset of, well, if I just tell everybody, all the bad shit, then that that's it. Not, nobody can say anything anymore. That's, I take the power away from, you know, my insecurity and, and take that back and just take ownership of my situation and, and um, learn from it. And it's been, like I said, I, I feel like I'm now living a, a second life, uh, you know, five that's or six amazing. years ago. That's amazing. And like you said, it's just facing that mirror and looking at yourself and I, I feel like we all go through that, you know, that there's, we see the potential in ourselves, you know, mm -hmm. and like you said, maybe it's just being ashamed of what you, your thing is, right? For you, it was the addiction and just, I, I think that's very empowering that you were able to face that fear. And thank you for sharing. Definitely that that experience is unique. Um, I just had an interview with one of a good friend that, you know, it, it's a tough, tough road to be in. Mm -hmm. And he dedicates right now to just assisting people, you know, getting out yep. of that, that environment and, um, what advice would you give someone that's, you know, going through abuse and just that helped you kind of face that fear and, and take that commitment of changing? Yeah, it's, it's a tough question to answer because I think I think the answer varies um, for each person. I don't yeah. think there's a there's a one size fits all approach. And, and I think that's an important point is people who are struggling with mental health issues, with addiction. Um, there are several different pathways to recovery like it, it's not. It's not just just this program or just that. It, it's really depends on the person. And I think I always I always say um, if somebody says they're in recovery, they're in recovery. Like just because it doesn't look like what you think it should or what I think it should, 
doesn't mean that they're not in recovery or they're not trying. And, and I think the biggest thing that took me, you know, now I'm kind of at a point where um, I'm indifferent, you know, towards drugs. Like it's not, I, it, it used to be, I think in early recovery, you get to a, a, a thing where it's like, you know, you build a life and, and rightfully so you have to around avoiding something and, and, you know, and you want to, it's almost like you want to be using or acting in certain ways, but you, you know, find ways to kind of fight through that. Yeah. And now I think I've, I've come to a point where I'm just indifferent and just, I don't, you know, I, I don't think about it. It's not like I have to think about avoiding it or, or do any, doing anything like that. Um, but what I've come to learn is when it, when it, when we're talking about addiction in, in particular, it's not really about drugs. It's, it was really about me figuring out why I was using drugs in the first place. Right. So, so for me, the drugs were actually treatment. I was treating myself. Yeah. I just didn't know how to effectively do it in a healthier way. So I was, I was using a substance to do it. And whether we're talking about People do it with food, shopping, gambling, sex, you name it. It's kind of all the same, right? We're using things to make ourselves feel better because I know for me as a kid, I wasn't taught the healthy ways to deal with those emotions and those feelings, right? I wasn't taught that it was okay for me as a kid, as a, as a young man to express the pain that I was in and what that's, I was feeling huge. from the trauma that I had as a kid and, and things that I went through. So that's what I did. I, I, I treated myself with the only way that I had found up until that point that worked. Yeah. Um, and then I had to figure out the healthy way, right? Yeah. Actually do that stuff. So then I, I didn't need that treatment anymore. I didn't need the drugs anymore just because I figured it out. You, you found the way, you right. found what works. And that's amazing. And you touched uh, briefly on like mental health and, mm -hmm. you know, as growing up, you know, at least in my perspective is in my culture is very machismo like it's very like mm -hmm. you know you don't talk about your feelings you don't talk about emotions right. you just kind of suck it up and go through life as that and i think in in this point in my career like i have three girls now and it's like no it's i have to find myself and understand that you know what i'm doing it can Im impact them impact my family mm -hmm. and you know it, it, what's your perspective in terms of that like growing up and just mental health in general yeah well i think for men in particular you know um in in most cultures it's we're taught that it's you, you we're taught that it's not okay as a man to express our feelings you know like like you you got at I, it wasn't manly to admit that i was in pain whether that was physical pain or emotional pain right i was taught as a kid just to rub some dirt on it you know, yeah. That was a saying that was used, right? So if you scrape your knee, ah, just rub some dirt on it, it's fine. But we take that same approach towards um, towards our emotional pain as well, right? We just kind of rub some dirt on it. Don't talk about it. We just, we're the man and we just have to deal with it. But I think not learning as a, as a young man to talk through things and express those things, that's what happens later on in life when you're trying to figure out how to how to deal with that stuff and i know for me as well i was also taught by the men around me i watched them use substances to kind of treat their their own pain and, and i just emulated that because that's what i saw um and, and that's what happens right we're, we're products of our environment and um the way that we grow up and, and things that we see that's what we perceive as normal it could be abnormal it could be unhealthy healthy but that's all we know Right. So if you grow up in an environment that has a lot of trauma, that's unhealthy, that has bad examples set for you, you're not going to know any different. You kind of have to stumble through life until hopefully at some point as an adult, you have that moment where you realize, oh, not everybody grew up the way I did. Maybe the way that I think or the way that I was taught isn't the best way. There's other ways and you learn those and then you can you can develop into somebody different or, or better yourself that's amazing do you personally feel that and and that touched very closely to me and i i strongly believe that the people you surround yourself with um i think there was a quote that i heard that you are the the, the fifth person of the people mm -hmm. you surround with sure um do you think that like you mentioned briefly yes the environment kind of impacts mm -hmm. your your livelihood now in your position that you're in now in your career um what environment are you putting yourself up to to be successful yeah that's a great point so for me where i'm at in my career now everything that i have and everything that i do is just a result of my relationships that's it and i've 
I don't want to say it's not even like I've w had the foresight to do it intentionally. It's just kind of who I was. And yeah. it turns out that that's really what you need to do. So I've always put my relationships first, put them ahead of money. I've put, you know, my reputation and how I how I conduct myself in my business, you know, before money. Um, and I try to think for the long term and just build relationships and, and doing those things and and building relationships and, and surrounding myself with the group of people that I want to emulate, um, that has allowed me to, to do what I do. That, that's really it. Um, and I always say to people, uh, um, you know, younger people, when it comes to your career, even like a very simple piece of advice that I've given is that if you're in a, uh, if you're at a company or you're in a job, you want to work for somebody that has what you want. You want to work for somebody that you want to emulate, okay. right? And if you don't, and I say on the flip side of that, if that's not the case, then hopefully they're paying you way more money than you, than you can get anywhere else so that you can do other things and invest that money. But if that's not the case, you need to be working for somebody that you want to be. Okay. Right? That's, that's huge. I mean, otherwise, what are you, what are you surrounding yourself with? That, that is so you know? true. That's so true. And I think, you know, like you said, we get stuck in our comfort zone so many times, especially, you know, as young adults growing up, you know, like we're, we're attracted to, to things that are nice. And, and I think I never looked at it through that angle of, you know, surround yourself with someone that you, that inspires you mm -hmm. in, in general, you know? And I think if you put in that work and that work ethic, yep. you, you'll feel, you'll pick up on things that, that will help you out in your career. Uh, it's amazing. Um, uh, how is life for you now? Like, um, I, I follow you on Instagram and that's how we got connected. Um, I, it's just, it's, it's inspiring really to see, you know, um, everything that you're accomplishing. Um, what would you say, one, one advice that you would give your younger self, um, let's say 13 year old, you know, cause that's the time where we're really trying to figure mm. out where we are based on all your experiences, where you are now in life. What's one advice you would give your younger self? Yeah, it's tough. It's tough because part of how I feel as well is that I really wouldn't change anything in my life. I agree. And I've had a lot of adversity. I've had a lot of trauma. I've had a lot of heartache. Um, and I, I wouldn't change it because every experience that I've had has made me who I am today. And I always try to remind myself that you can't have the good without the bad, right? Whether that's, you know, when I was, so my father passed away, um, you know, a few years ago. And when I was thinking about my father and, and his shortcomings, because him and I are very much alike, you know, we, we thought a lot alike, obviously that's where I learned, uh, how to, you know, cope with, with substances and things like that. But I, I also learned to be very forgiving with him and other people with our relationships by saying, well, yeah, like he had these negative qualities, but I, I, it's not fair for me to enjoy the good qualities that he had without also accepting the negative. And I think that goes for every aspect of life. Yeah. Um, doesn't mean I wouldn't benefit seriously from some advice. Yeah. Um, what I would say to, to my 13 year old self or to any 13 year old that's really struggling is that it really is going to work out. Things always work themselves out. Um, it, even in moments where it seems like, you know, it's the end of the world it really isn't and it really is going to be okay uh and, and things work themselves out and just to just to keep moving like i'm a big action person so if you if you wake up and you're kind of feeling like there's no hope just put one one foot in front of the other just that's, keep just keep going that's it um and, and you'll figure it out as you go but you're the the only way to to make progress in life is is just through action and just through moving just keep that's walking amazing. that's, that's it. amazing i love that i love that and in terms you you briefly touched touch, you know talking to your younger self uh, i personally believe like mentorship is it's mm. it's great you know like do you do you advocate that like people reaching out for mentorship of course of course yeah it's uh you know i've been fortunate through my, even though i was going through a lot of things uh, you know in my in my 20s uh, i still was fortunate to have certain mentors right people that um we're just there's always going to be people in your life that you connect with yeah and you want to connect with people like i said that you want to emulate and have things that you want the life that you want um but part of that as well is you have to put yourself in positions to be able to meet people right so a big part of my life and why i've been able to be so successful so quickly in what i do 
is because I'm always willing to be outside, shaking hands, meeting people, uh, and I prioritize that. So, and I always try to bring value to people without anything, without ex expecting anything in return. And I think that's a big thing where a lot of people have a mentality of, well, I don't want to do, I don't want to give something to all these people because most people don't give anything back and you're just wasting your energy and people are selfish and, and whatever the case is. And they might be right. But if I, if I provide value and do something for a hundred people and only two or three of them do something back, that's life changing for me. That's worth the other 95 people that yeah. I provided value and gave things to, um, that didn't, give any value back because that's okay. And, and that's why every situation I go into is I don't have an expectation. It's kind of like uh, holding the door for somebody, right? Yeah. So if you hold the door for somebody to walk into a store and they just walk by you and don't say thank you, some people will be like, oh, you're welcome. Well, why? Yeah. Just, just hold the door without expectation. They don't have to thank you. You know, that's, that's crazy. Recently, I've just been drawn more to like reading and self-development books. And just that right now, what you're talking about is, is just so happens I finished reading The Goal-Giver. Yeah. It's kind of the pinnacle foundations of what it is. And it's, you know, giving without expectations. But I think the chapter that really resonated with me, um, if you read it, it's a, it's a short, short read. It's a, a good book. And it just capitalized on that, like giving without expectations. And I think for me, I'm in a point that it's OK to receive as well. Mm. Like that's the biggest yeah. thing that. I personally like to give, 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 mm -hmm. and just being open to receiving. Yeah. I feel like maybe sometimes I feel I'm not worthy of receiving the, mm -hmm. and it's just training myself to be like, it's okay to receive the blessings yeah. that the universe is bringing back to you. Definitely. Definitely something I've struggled with as well is accepting good things. And I've actually had a, a pretty strong pattern of um, self-sabotage, right? So for, it's actually interesting for me when it talks about, um, when we talk about drug use, for example, just an easy example, my use of drugs always increased or would I would relapse if things were good. It wasn't when things were bad. It was when things got really good. That's when I self-destructed yeah. because I had this internal kind of thermometer that didn't, didn't allow me to, to be happy. And it's, it's actually interesting. And you don't find these things out through, like it takes a lot of years, takes a lot of, you know, doing it over and over to see the pattern. And yeah. I eventually saw, and it takes therapy, but I, I even learned through therapy that because of whatever I experienced as a kid, I would even physically limit myself. Like if I would smile or laugh, I would correct it and I would stop smiling because it was like something in my mind yeah. didn't think that I deserved it. It was very, very interesting. Um, and you just, you know, I do deserve things. You, you deserve yeah. good things, yeah. right? But it's not always, you know, we, we, we're not doing it intentionally, but I think it's very common for us to be uncomfortable receiving love or good things. Yeah. It's, it's so funny. You mentioned the laughing, the smiling, right? I just caught myself a couple of like during the pandemic, it's just a crazy, it's like, I have noticed most of my pictures. I'm always like, you know, never showing my teeth, yeah. maybe insecurity, whatever it's, but my wife is like, you need to smile. Yeah. <laughs> and it felt awkward at it's first. It's okay. It's okay to like, smile. Yeah. Seeing your smile for the first time. And I was just like, it comes natural now, you know, and it's just embracing that, you know? Yeah. Um, I talked right now briefly about the pandemic. How was that experience for you? I know a lot of people that I interview, it was mm -hmm. kind of like a turning point for them. And yeah. um, what, what's your, your outtake on that? Not much changed for me because I worked uh, through the pandemic and actually in the car business, it was still very, very busy. It's actually the past two years in the car business has been probably the busiest and craziest it's ever been. Yeah. Uh, cars have been, you know, values of used cars have been increasing. That's true. It's been it's been insane. Um, so for me, it was just busy. I just worked every day. Um, there was a very short time at the beginning that I was home for, you know, uh, maybe a month or two. Um, but yeah, outside of that, I, th I think the car business, especially having to get service and stuff like that was somewhat of an essential business that, you know, we just, we just worked through it. And, um, it was kind of like a gold rush The cars were just worth more money and people <laughs> paid all this crazy yeah. money for cars. And even, even on the higher end cars, there's several cars that, um, have come down in value, a hundred thousand, 200,000, you know, big, big, uh, jumps. Uh, just over the past year, okay. kind of cooling back down. Yeah, yeah. things are kind of getting like, back to normal. Yeah, um, it's crazy because I left the the. I used to work at a dealership. I left it right before the pandemic. No, the wrong like, time. Yeah, wrong time. And I I catch myself like, like I don't know. I think going back on the deserving part is like, 
I there's opportunities and I kind of like hold myself right before big opportunities mm. happen. And with me this year, I promised myself like this is my my thing. Mm. It brings me joy. I find doing this enjoyment, not yeah. work. And I'm gonna write it. I'm gonna stick with it because it's what's what's driving me. Yeah. Uh, do you agree with me with uh, finding your your passion and just going with it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think you can be successful at anything as long as you're willing to put enough time into it and, and eat enough shit, really. Yeah, it's like, yeah. if this is what you enjoy doing, it's going to help you because it's going to allow you to keep doing it consistently, even when you're not seeing anything coming out of it. Yeah. Right. And that's the important part is that most people in any business we are trained that we want to see instant results. Yeah. We're not willing to just put our heads down and keep working. I mean, the most successful people in the world did a lot of them, you know, if you talk, let's, let's, for example, an easy one with talking about um, social media or YouTube or podcasting, you have a guy like Mr. Beast, right? Probably the biggest YouTuber yeah. alive has a business that's, you know, valued at at least a billion dollars. And I don't know the exact numbers, but I, I I would dare to say that he probably did YouTube every single day for at least a decade before he made any money. That's true. Yeah. Right? And if he didn't love doing it, that'd be very, very hard <laughs> yeah, to do sure. that every day for a decade. So it's not necessarily like you have to do something that you, you love to be successful at it, but it just makes it a hell of a lot easier to, to keep going. And I, I, I like what you said, you know, you got to eat shit for the, yeah. you gotta go through it. It's part of the process. And I think recently I just catch myself in that position, like success, the way it, it real success, you know, cause there's sometimes like luck, it has a big play in it, but real success is going through the hard times. You, it's a part of the process and that's really what makes it rewarding when mm -hmm. you get it right. Yeah. So yeah, definitely. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I think we're close to time. Is there anything that you would like to say? Some people like to give a quote or something that, you know, they kind of hold on to that, you know, gets them through the day. No, I, I don't, nothing in particular. I just, you know, I really appreciate you wanting to sit down and talk to me and, um, you know, I, I, I hope this continues to be successful for you. I mean, you seem to be doing a great job. I mean, I've, I've enjoyed the, the stuff that I've seen from you so far thank you, and, thank you. and, um, you, you you deserve all the, the uh, success. <laughs> Thank so, you. Appreciate it. You know, take it and enjoy it, and uh, just keep going, man. You know, keep keep doing these, even if it you know you're not seeing the results you want. Just keep banging them out, and eventually, you know, you're gonna get. It's gonna pay off. So. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it, guys. I'll, I'll leave all your social medias. Yeah, sure. If you guys want to connect, follow him. Um, thank you. And so, I'll shout out to uh, Pinnacle Imports as well. Oh yeah, here. definitely. So beautiful. Charlie's place here is beautiful. He's letting us use it to uh, to shoot the. It's eye candy. It really <laughs> yeah, it's nice, man. It's not not a bad. Yeah, not not a bad place to be. Definitely. So thank you, Seth. Thank Appreciate you, it. Yeah, pleasure. Appreciate it. You too.